so we shop on time. Uh, we always want to make sure that we are starting on time. So uh, just a repeating for those people who joined, uh, uh, who joined earlier and then some people who just joined, uh, we're starting our series, this event right now. Uh, a quick introduction about myself. My name is Wendy Koch. Uh, I'm a partner of Hanawa Group. And today we have a guest, uh, Mr. Jay Zhao. Uh, he's a founder, founding partner of Leonis Capital and an and a ex-partner of T-Fun. Uh, very quickly, before we actually dive into today's event, is some housekeeping matter. So Asia CEO community has this really unique setup in a, in a way where we allow people to commute, uh, connect with each other through the chat box. So we're, we didn't set up the event as a webinar, uh, which means uh, everyone is practically online and you can see each other. So for those uh, of you who are not asking questions, or uh, I would kindly ask you to mute yourself. Uh, if you do have a question, I, my preference would be for you to uh, paste it into the chat box. And I'll try my best to address that. Uh, if I do miss it, let me know, raise your hand uh, through the Zoom function where you can actually raise your hand. Let me know about that. And uh, the final housekeeping, uh, it's also in a way, uh, Gary was supposed to host the meeting, but unfortunately Gary has a family emergency. Uh, he is in the call, so we're very glad that he can still dial in, uh, but he's fine. Uh, so I just wanna let you know that I will be hosting the call. And so that there might be difficulty for me going through the chat box uh, as, promptly as I would like to be. So with that backdrop, uh, I wanna kind of like kick into our event today. So again, it's a talk to VC series. So it's about talking to venture capitalists. And why do, why do we want to launch it this year? Um, this is in consideration of a lot of feedback from our members uh, since the event that I last hosted. There were a lot of questions about, you know, venture capital, about investing into startup, and so we thought it might be a good time for this year to actually kickstart a series about venture capital about startup. And that's the reason why we're having this first episode today. And this first episode we have Jay and who has a very interesting background. And in, I kind of wanted to jump in a little bit into that before I give Jay the chance to introduce about himself. It's, um, he has a background in enterprise technology startup. So enterprise technology, somehow has been like the hottest uh, uh, sector for a lot of uh, investors right now. And it seems like a lot of the enterprise tech were also able to navigate COVID-19 uh, much better than a lot of consumer tech. And I think this cannot be a better time to jump into this topic and this sector to really explore a little bit. We will also go into a more general uh, information about, you know, how does Jay make in his investment, which I think uh, are a lot of participants will be interested to hear on. So, so Jay, are, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yep. So Jay, um, can you just kind of like give mm -hmm. us your background? You know, how did you get into venture capital? I think mm. for the purpose of our participants, a lot of them come from uh, startup companies, a lot of them come from bigger companies, but I think every one of them would be interested to know, venture capital seems to be a, a small uh, industry and a lot of people kind of like want to know more about it. There seems to be some secrecy around. So I really wanted mm -hmm. to know, how did you get into this sector? Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Wendy, for having me. Um, and and I, I, I can definitely feel this is community uh, type of uh, event and the dynamic, which is great. Uh, it's very intimate. So um, definitely uh, feel free to ask any questions, um, you know, um, uh, either through chat box or whatnot. So we'll kind of go through uh, some of the things that you care about. So at, at least, um, uh, so to uh, answer uh, some of the Wendy's uh, question. So my background, I uh, right now um, I'm managing a fund called uh, Leonis Capital. So we're an AI focused fund. We invest in um, what we call the automation economy. So uh, companies that we see as AI first company, uh, mostly in enterprise side, and also some of them have application on the consumer side. Uh, we definitely would love to be a capital partner to those company, either they're in the US or in, you know, in China. Um, two of the largest uh, ecosystems that we see in the world today. 
Um, uh, and the other uh, uh, kind of the side note about me, so I have the kind of the fortune to be in venture and do investing uh, over the past 10 years, uh, 10 plus years uh, in both uh, countries, uh, US and China. Um, before Leonis Capital, uh, I was managing a fund called T Fund, which was a CBC uh, fund uh, that's backed by um, TCL uh, Corporation. Um, so we have a mandate to back uh, deep, tech, uh, do, uh, deep tech companies, AI companies, and really trying to marry the, the best of both sides, uh, the corporate resource, plus uh, you know, do an independent venture investing uh, investment. Um, before that, you know, I was uh, doing early stage investment at two of the most um, kind of well-established funds uh, in, in the Valley. Um, and some of the companies that we have backed um, are, uh, you know, kind of go all the way back to like 1990s uh, SIBO system and to more recent, um, you know, Marketa uh, Anna plan. Uh, one is a public company uh, and one is soon to be a public company. Um, more on the consumer side, probably people know more about, you know, companies like um, uh, Pandora and uh, uh, Airbnb. Um, and also, uh, we're fortunate enough to be, uh, you know, investor in those companies as well. So I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, those cases. And uh, but that's kind of like a level background about myself. Yeah, thank you for that. That was very informative. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of those that you have described, I would definitely want to jump into that and dwell deeper. But you talk about the companies that you have invested in, you know, the comprises of AI, uh, background mm. data, kind of like uh, big data kind of in, uh, companies. I kind of wanted to bring up this slide. Mm. Well, which is uh, the companies that you have uh, partnered with? Uh, yep. And I think uh, one, uh, just, just very quickly for the participant is, mm. uh, if you cannot see my slide, what you can do is actually use the speaker view in Zoom, and then you will be able to see the slide uh, behind me. So, so I kind of wanted to point to this particular slide. Uh, this is a list of companies that you have partnered with and they include the companies that you have exit, exited and it include a company that have became a unicorn and still maintain, still are a unicorn. So I think in particular, I kind of wanted to dwell into that. Like how mm -hmm. did you identify those companies and and what did you do when you're partnering with them? And I think yeah. that would help us understand more about your background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ha happy to talk more about it. So first of all, um, you know, I think about investment companies, at least for me, you know, I really think about being a partner to, uh, to entrepreneurs. And because at the end of the day, um, you're not, um, you're, you know, as early stage investor, you're really not just writing a check but you really have to build a bonding uh, with companies and uh, with founders at early stage. So, um, so, you know, we typically refer to companies that we partner with rather than the company that we invest. And, um, you know, from the list of these companies, um, you know, some of them, I, um, you know, I serve on the board of those companies. Some of them, you know, I source the deal and some of them, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, I, I kind of go through the whole thing from uh, meeting the entrepreneur from day one to all the way serve on the board. Um, and um, I think to give some context, right? So one of the company um, I didn't source, but it's one of the higher performing company. Uh, it's really hot right now. Um, it's called Marketa. So Marketa is this company. Uh, they doing the API provider for uh, what we call the on-demand economy. So a lot of apps that we're seeing today, um, you know, that's been pretty uh, successful, like DoorDash, uh, Uber Eats, and uh, Instacart. You know, all those on-demand economy uh, companies. Uh, at the back end, you still have to do transaction. You should still have to do uh, expense management. Um, so one of the problems that they had at the time, um, you know, is to look for a good tech vendor to help um, provide that robust back end, um, so that when you have, uh, you know, your uh, dasher, you know, come to the store pick up the food, you can actually um, do a proper accounting to that. And also, at the early days, right at DoorDash, they actually don't have. Um, uh, they don't have this uh, kind of robust integration with vendors. So they actually have to give out like a uh, card, a debit card and a credit card uh, for the delivery person. And at that time there was fraud. There was a good amount of fraud going on, uh, you know, um, just for the simple reason people can take advantage and they will. Um, but now with Makata, uh, you can automate the different data point such as, uh, you know, your uh, geolocation and order uh, uh, time data and, uh, you know, and then also the data from the Dasher 
integrate that all together so that you so that the credit card will only unlock when the debtor approach closer to the vendor. So all of that is powered by software and all of that is automated. Um, and of, of course, you know, um, because of COVID, we've seen a lot more volume um, you know, through the on-demand economy companies and also through e-commerce companies. And that uh, kind of give a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the push and the tailwind for companies like Makata. Um, we're early stage investor in that company. And uh, frankly, you know, that company through, uh, you know, if you, it's all public information, you would do, do some research. It's a very interesting uh, story around Makata because initially that's not the idea. They're not thinking about being the stripe for uh, mm-hmm. own demand economy. They're not thinking about doing the API uh, company at all. They're thinking about like doing the reward program, right? Something simple, like going to a mom and pop restaurant, mom and pop restaurant and sell uh, the reward card. That didn't work out that well. You know, the market demand was not there and it was a really hard sell. Uh, so this company actually went through the up and down like multiple times until they kind of hit to the, uh, you know, the, the, the sweet spot. So uh, this is just another kind of interesting story to talk about the resilience of, um, of, of entrepreneurship and the resilience of uh, starting a company um, that, uh, and, and investing in that company that early. Resilience is definitely a topic that we will get into because I think it's so yeah. relevant now in these days. But I think what is interesting is you talk about they went through up and down. Mm. My question would then be because this is what a lot of startups are experiencing or would, would have to go through naturally. It's how mm. it's when do you decide to pivot? Mm. what's the right time is it just like a gut feel and you, you have that because you have been an entrepreneur and you just kind of know about it or are you really waiting for feedback from customers to decide that yeah that's a great question uh, I mean when to stick uh, stick it out and when to like pivot uh, that's always a very <laughs> interesting question it's more of a question I would say uh, art than science um, uh, sometimes data can be tricky, right? You, uh, frankly, if you are sophisticated enough, you can just like uh, slice the data any way that you want to, to, to make the case any however way that you like it. Um, so the way that I would say, um, you know, when we talk to our founders, uh, our CEOs, is that, you know, how closely you are uh, staying to the customers. Um, and that's frankly, you know, we talk about the, you know, how does a VC do due diligence at uh, this early stage, uh, we are with the with the uh, with the unknowns, right? Just like our early stage founders. Um, so a lot of ways that we're trying to understand uh, the problem is to understand the market. So if anybody's interested, you know, um, uh, when he knows this, you know, I actually have a blog post, um, you know, just about you know how does we see due, due due diligence for early stage companies. So a lot of a lot of things is it's not known. It's not like there is a um, a uh, checklist, you just fill it out and then, you know, boom, at the end, you kind of number crunch and answer, uh, you know, question and answers. A lot of time mm-hmm. is that we ask multiple questions to get an idea whether that founder know, knows his or her market uh, well enough or not. And does that person have some unique and deep insight that not many people know about? Um, it's, uh, it's more, um, a, that's why I say it's kind of more art than, art than science. But you know, having said that, there are a good amount of data points that you can ping to, uh, right? For example, you know, in Makata's case, right? It's clear that the reward card program and, and the market, market is not, not there. Um, you know, you can look at the data like in terms of the sales cycle, in terms of the value being generated and the founders agree too. So uh, if in that case, both the investor and founder feel like, well, that's not attractive market, then maybe we should do something else. And they did, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there was multiple cases like that, right? How Slack was founded and started. They, before Slack, they were just a gaming a company, right? And the gaming, uh, obviously the idea didn't work out and they kind of pivot into a new direction and it just took off. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously that's not the kind of a typical case uh, in all cases. But uh, a lot of times when VCs say that, you know, you invest in the founder, I mean, to a, a lot of degree, you do invest in founders, the ability to learn and to iterate and to navigate this kind of the evolving um, and emerging market dynamic as they go. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the good thing is that you want to invest in a in company, in a management team that can change and can adopt fast rather than, uh, uh, you know, a, a management team that's just react too slow. 
or uh, you know being stubborn stubborn for the sake of being stubborn right that's that's not the type of company that you want to get behind yeah you, you, that's a really good uh explanation that reminds me of the quote uh, i think there was one philosopher that said that only change is permanent everything else mm-hmm. is kind of like temporary in a way yeah, that's right. so so when yes. you talk about change i think that is so relevant uh, for a lot mm-hmm. of the startups and i know y- your background also span across the united states uh, mm-hmm. china and israel and we have a questions from the from the participants you know mm-hmm. asking about southeast asia and mm-hmm. i actually do not know about your experience on southeast asia or about your viewpoint but i think uh, i would be interested mm-hmm. to hear about it the, the question is really about you know, what, what's your view about Southeast Asia? And, mm-hmm. and the, the audience was quoting that there's a TikTok has set up R&D center in Singapore. And, uh, and it seems like the startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia is emerging. So what, what are your views on Southeast Asia? Yeah, so uh, from an investor's point of view, I will fund company anywhere uh, as long as there are great companies, great founders. Uh, so boundaries so that's- is not a problem for you. Yeah, that's right. So the, the border is never a problem. Um, I, I'm not expert in uh, in Southeast Asia, the ecosystem, uh, but I've heard great things about it. Um, I have uh, my GP friend who actually, you know, they uh, they will do investment in the Valley and then they go back uh, to Southeast Asia and they start Southeast, Southeast Asia only fund. Um, and it seems like, uh, you know, some of the few characteristic uh, make sense, right? The valuation is uh, cheaper, lower than uh, than Silicon Valley and certainly than China. Um, and the potential uh, for future growth um, is very exciting. So I think that thesis makes a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, but again, you know, like uh, I'll fund anybody, uh, no matter where they are, as long as a great, great company and great entrepreneurs. So, so which means Southeast Asia, uh, would still have a lot of chance if the if they say if they're an enterprise tech company where the technology can be provided to customers globally, would that be um, kind of like a, a right analogy? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think so. I, I think the the beauty uh, of SaaS, right, of enterprise tech, or even just consumer tech, um, it's it's just really about like the beauty of internet is that as long as you build a uh, useful product and people start use it. It doesn't really matter which country uh, that your uh, your headquarters is based, right? I mean, that's kind of like not considering the U.S. China thing. But uh, let's say if your company in Singapore, company in Southeast Asia, then uh, you know, uh, sure, like you, if you can build a useful product, um, you know, for Western market, um, then you know, it should be able to scale. Now, most of the challenge. Uh, for this cross-border expansion is to really come down to the founder. So a lot of times, you know, if the founder doesn't have oversee, um, you know, education experience or work, ex- work experience, then typically uh, sometimes a lot harder to kind of uh, expand and beyond, right? Um, but I think with for Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of thesis and a lot of exciting things I've heard about is that, you know, it's, a, it's an emerging and growing, fast growing market with a huge market potential. And in that case, you know, you have, uh, you know, you won't have any problem to see multiple unicorn coming from that market. And I think that's kind of like the, the underlying big thesis, a big bet for a lot of venture capital funds uh, start investing and paying attention there. Um, for me, you know, we're starting, we're a startup ourselves as well. So, you know, once we scale, we might, you know, set up office there as well. So one, I'm looking forward to that uh, one day to come uh, fairly soon, hopefully. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. When you talk about um, uh, Marketa and enterprise tech, I, mm. I wanted to bring uh, the participants to take a look at this particular news. It, it says right now, it goes back to my earlier uh, statement that people seems to be people seems to be very interested in enterprise tech. Uh, and and if you look at this particular news from Bloomberg, uh, everyone wants a piece of that. And a total of 30.4 billion has been invested into enterprise technology companies. And that is a one third more than consumer technology companies. And so your background is in enterprise tech. And, and I, I kind of I wanted to tap a little bit more about what you see about enterprise tech right now. And, mm. uh, and, and you did an amazing comparison, which I think I should bring that up for the uh, participants information. I'm going to move myself a little bit so people can see my slide. 
is so for the participants, this slide is prepared by Jay. And it's a really interesting one because it's a comparison between US enterprise tech uh, and China enterprise tech, uh, comparing them from 1 billion market cap to 1 trillion. And, uh, and, and where do we see the opportunities? And in, uh, we've, because we talk about Southeast Asia, I think this comparison could go beyond China as well. And it would apply to Southeast Asia as well, right? So, so Jay, what's your will on that yeah. when you are preparing this, this information? Yeah, so um, just to kind of paint some color around it. Um, so we did the internal analysis, which is, um, you know, if you look at um, the enterprise, uh, public um, enterprise companies in the US, which is fairly robust and fairly mature, right? In that you have different size of companies, public companies ranging from 1 billion to 1 trillion. Um, and that includes many of the companies that you are aware of, like Salesforce, uh, Intel, and micro, Microsoft, uh, all iconic companies uh, in the U.S. And I think they're leading uh, U.S., you know, being uh, one of the oldest and, and most robust tech ecosystem, uh, provide a really good example of what a mature and, and, and uh, mature uh, enterprise ecosystem should look like. So now if you look at China, and I think that can apply to many other ecosystems, you know, such as Southeast Asia, uh, as well, certainly, is that if you map that out, uh, certainly in China's case, uh, we kind of max out uh, above 100 billion. Um, and uh, the, for the company that's below 100 billion, uh, that they tend to be older public companies. Um, so what that means is that you actually have this kind of leaf, uh, potential opportunity for enterprise company to be leapfrogged into that uh, trillion dollar category. Um, not next year, but certainly over the next one or two decades. Um, and, and, you know, to Wendy's point, um, you know, enterprise is, uh, is, is sexy to us uh, because it's resilient uh, by nature. If you look at the performance for enterprise companies uh, against the public market and certainly against consumer companies, uh, it doesn't have that kind of a you know, huge up and down or uh, public markets lower performance. It's quite consistent uh, in that it just keeps genera generating good returns because enterprise customers they are they they, uh, they tend to spend a large dollar amount for the service that they need. And two, uh, as the world is becoming more tech enabled and more digital digitalized, um, you're going to see that um, you know enterprise tech is taking away uh, taking away more value from the traditional route and also. By uh, automation um, features that we're seeing more and more happening right now. Got it. That's that's really interesting. When when because I had a I was like kind of doing some research, mm. and apparently this is like an, an enterprise tech list uh, which was prepared by uh, the website enterprisetech30.com, and this is the 2020 list, and they list out the early stage, mid stage, and late stage enterprise technology companies. And it appears a lot of them are based in the United States. Uh, based on your comparison just now, do you see the in the next 10 years where there will be a lot more of these companies coming out from Asia, uh, Asia what, or China that goes into that three category, early stage, you know, mid stage or late stage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, um, one thing that to be mindful about is the next generation of uh, enterprise companies, the iconic one, the unicorns, they're not going to be the same uh, uh, same form or same uh, kind of product shape like the U.S. counterpart. Um, so one thing um, I think most people kind of know, uh, U.S. investors certainly have tried to invest in, uh, you know, uh, China's version of Salesforce or China's version of uh, Microsoft or whatever, right, Intel, uh, five, five to six years ago, and that did not work, right? And, and there was a lot of uh, uh, capital kind of pulling to the SaaS sector in China. I mean, in our view, um, that, you know, I, I get the argument for it, but um, in our view, that might not be the correct lens to look at it. So at Leonis Capital, one thing that we are super excited about and we encourage entrepreneurs to, to, to think more about this way is that try to think about how you can utilize um, the tech of AI similar to the infrastructure of mobile, similar to the infrastructure of cloud, right? Um, those are the two mega trends that kind of push and generate multiple, multiple unicorns 
uh, uh, being created in, in, in your uh, ecosystem. Um, so in this case, in, you know, we're, we're analyzing U.S. and China. So certainly mm-hmm. in China, uh, we're thinking about, you know, what's uh, the next, uh, what's the next uh, iconic company, enterprise company will look like. And our um, view at this point is that it's likely to be more AI driven, more automation driven um, than the traditional SaaS tool, traditional uh, you know, SaaS platform. Because the core of SaaS, um, the enterprise in enterprise sector, is about you know uh, digitalization. Is about being on the cloud, but that does not work in, in our view. That does not work uh, really well in China enterprise customers because you you haven't generated enough value for those decision maker yet. Um, so in enterprise uh, sales, right, you always want to establish a really clear ROI, meaning what can my tech product do for you in terms of generating revenue top line or cutting out costs, right? The, 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 the middle part of it, of you know, having impact on the bottom line. Um, so we feel pretty excited with the whole trend of, of automation, um, you know, similar to how in Asia, right? We have a lot of leapfrogging in mobile and the mobile payment. Um, you know, I think something uh, like that might happen uh, in the enterprise space. Uh, so to win this point, right? You, you now right now you have top top thirty um, uh, list of enterprise company in the U.S., but I think given uh, 10, 20 years, uh, it won't be surprising to see a similar list um, uh, from Asia and from China as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I am seeing uh, some participants have posted questions. I would definitely get into them. Uh, if you have mm. ad- uh, more questions of, uh, from other participants please feel free to post into the chat box. On, based on that backdrop, what Jay, you have explained, it's, mm-hmm. uh, I wanted to go to uh, one of the slides that we talked about uh, prior to this call, because you talk about how companies can become unicorn. And these are mm-hmm. some of the companies you have partnered with who are to, who, whom you believe will be unicorn. Yeah. And, right. uh, and I'm interested to learn about what are the potential you see in them? Uh, if you can just mm-hmm. use an example to describe that. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, VC's dream is to uh, breed a lot of unicorn, and uh, uh, that's kind of like our ambition. Uh, and uh, that's kind of certainly our hope, right? When we look at the company that we invested, uh, when we invest in a company at early stage, we all hope and have the reasoning to believe that they can be a billion dollar company um, because that's our. Um, so one of the company um, I'll talk more about because um, I was fairly involved throughout the whole cycle uh, is a company called uh, Workboard. Uh, again, it's an enterprise company. Um, but uh, uh, what they do is that they provide the go alignment, go alignment, uh, t- a SaaS tool for enterprise companies. Um, so all you can think about, think about like OKR methodology, uh, um, SaaS product um, for Fortune 500 companies. Um, and with this company, um, you know, if you think about uh, well, just you know, kind of stay on why we believe this could be a big company. If you think about Salesforce, you know, you think about that's a CRM cloud, right? That's a cloud that you go that you go to to manage your customer relationship. And then we think about Anaplan. Um, it's a roughly ten billion dollar company. You think about like financial planning cloud. So that means that if you're a large uh, enterprise organization, you have to do financial planning. You have to do this coordination, but from financial planning planning's perspective, um, then you go to Anaplan. Uh, they are the company for that. Now there are different cloud, right? You know, HR cloud. You probably think about Workday, right? The com- public company being around for for a while. Now similar uh, analogy, right? Uh, when we think about Workboard, we think about you know company go alignment uh, planning. So not financial planning, but you know, I think about OKR OKR planning. So um, this is the kind of like the um, uh, kind of the, the, the you know, uh, in and out of companies breathing on a daily basis, right? Uh, most of the time, companies do quarterly planning, right? Where the, your supervisors kind of send you an email and say, hey, let's do offsite. Let's do this planning. What's our next quarter goal? goal? And then, you know, how do you measure that and all that? So with Workboard, everything is, um, is on the platform. It's on the cloud. And that can be updated and tracked in real time. Um, so from the, the founder, uh, Deidre, and her husband, um, uh, they were uh, uh, serial founders. 
um, and uh, they have their own kind of unique insight and pain point by working um, at big companies like IBM. Uh, their last company was acquired by IBM and they were like, you know, a VP in IBM for a while. But when they came around and, and you know, talked to us about their insight, about, you know, the problem they're trying to solve, we were like, yeah, that makes sense. Because, um, you know, at that time, you know, people trying to think about, uh, people were tired about communicating through email. And the one thing that I remember really clearly is that she walked into walked into our pitch meeting with a huge binder um, of uh, the uh, the communication, like the emails and the other things a company has to go through like on the quarterly basis so that everybody can be on the same page. So he's, she's like, you know, with us, you don't need that binder. Like all those paper, you can throw it away. You don't need to print those uh, things. So that's pretty powerful, right? Um, uh, the value proposition for the product. And obviously the way that I describe it sounds like, you know, yeah, we kind of know it uh, from the beginning and everything makes sense and the company just took off. Um, but obviously it, the, the reality is not, not that easy and not that, uh, not that uh, rosy. Um, the company went through different uh, iteration in terms of go to market, in terms of, you know, finding uh, customers, in terms of, uh, you know, recruiting the key members. Um, but the good thing is that, uh, you know, you kind of uh, uh, just keep trying um, and uh, you believe that there is a need for it. I mean, by logic, there should be a need. Now, the question is, how do you educate the market to let them know that there is a need and you should pay for it? And they did that. Uh, once they did that, um, then uh, some other venture fund uh, like GGV and uh, uh, Microsoft, they become the following investor to this company. So for us, it's great because we're the first seed investor into the company. And now, uh, you know, the company is kind of off to the races. Wow. I, I hear agility, uh, you know, description about startups uh, mentality that hmm. they, beside agility, obviously they have to be resilient as well, uh, hmm. which kind of goes back to what we were talking earlier about that agility in a way kind of correspond to the ability and the willingness to pivot and adapt. And uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, and, and so this lady, she, uh, she worked, uh, she believed Marketa is a great company uh, <laughs> and she worked in a horizontal function and was placing to start up for 12 to 18 months for venture capitalists to uh, take the trailblazing ideas and bring in the lean operating structure. So her, her mm. question is, um, uh, do, you, do you agree that founders' willingness to pivot, it's a uh, part of the gateway mentality required to reach that event horizon? So if we look at the, this list of companies that we have, we have put up here, how many of these companies have pivoted from their very original idea? And how many have mm -hmm. been able to stick to stick onto uh, their original idea and still be able to succeed? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, the examples like um, Slack is an extreme example, right? You pivot from a gaming company to a messaging app and then went public. Um, so that's a really, really rare uh, type of, type of a pivot. Uh, that becomes successful. Now, many things that people don't talk about is that, you know, you kind of do that extreme pivot and then you fail, right? Many companies obviously, you know, follow that route. Um, but what's mostly common in startup world is you do micro pivot, right? Um, and uh, you do micro pivot, you, and, and if you're a founder, you don't really think about it as a pivot per se. You think about it as evolution of the product and uh, the, the way that you can serve your customer better. Um, so, so that's kind of like the mentality that we, uh, we look for, um, uh, when backing founders, um, you have, they always have to be able to learn and, and uh, iterate really fast. Um, now, uh, if it's, let me, let me think about, so with all these, uh, company on the list, I don't think any one of them have gone through like a major, major pivot. Um, one of the company I might talk about, um, uh, they did have a pivot, but it's not like a um, Slack style pivot. Um, it's a company called Servios. Um, so Servios, they are one of the leading, um, or if not the number one uh, VR game studio um, yeah, in the world. They have um, published really nice, uh, I mean, really engaging, really high quality VR games. Uh, and they have secured some really uh, kind of uh, uh, high profile IP around it as well. But when this company was first started, um, it was um, it was by two of the uh, very um, 
uh, very smart founders who has unique insight about building the VR headset. Uh, very similar to Oculus, right? That was kind of uh, when Oculus was acquired, well, was founded and then quickly got acquired by Facebook. So, um, you know, other than Oculus, uh, then there's another company called Servius. Uh, the, the technical uh, uh, pedigree uh, of those founders are very impressive. And uh, the insight for them in terms of how to build an ecosystem is very equally impressive as well. But the original idea, uh, original product is the hardware, is the headset. Uh, for Oculus to build. And they did build that uh, really expensive, really high-end stuff. Like, you know, as investor, we love it. You know, we love to try on different demo, especially VR demo, right? Because you kind of have to show up in the office and then, you know, put it on and be amazed by the uh, the zombie killing uh, game, which, is, you know, I can still remember this day, which is crazy. That's just how immersive the uh, the VR experience was uh, they had built. But the problem is that the hardware, hardware was so expensive uh, you, it's hard to sell to the mainstream market. And uh, as a VC, you know, you don't really want to use your capital to fund hardware manufacturing and development that tend to be really uh, intensive uh, on the uh, on the fund usage side as well. So anyway, so long story short, uh, the company feel like, well, if that's the case, um, what, what are we good at? We're good at, you know, making games, engaging games, and uh, we have a lot of uh, engineers, um, you know, kind of uh, um, on the gaming development side as well. So one thing that we can do is um, that that other companies, other man- OEMs to manufacture the hardware, and that's just focus on the high quality game uh, that, that we do, uh, that differentiate ourselves. And they did that. So um, they're doing fairly well. Um, you know, obviously uh, with different company, you have a different market. Now, with the VR market, you know, the hope is that it's taking a while, but, uh, you know, eventually it will, it will take up um, to a certain percentage of the mainstream so that, you know, it will be a, a public uh, or unicorn company as well. Um, but, you know, I think with this strategy, it makes sense because um, even if the number of VR users is not big, uh, you still have a subset of uh, gamers who crave for high quality game. So, uh, so that's why they can relatively demand a premium uh, of their game than their competitors. So anyway, yeah. so that's kind of like the, the pivot that they have done. Yeah, so it's interesting because this is the first time I'm hearing the, the phrase micro pivot, which I yeah. think really perhaps describe more accurately about a lot of the startups because it's really hard to pivot completely like 180 degrees because that would be so different to what you have accumulated in terms of experience or in terms of the product features that you have already uh, uh, prepared for. So I think micro pivot, uh, it, it sounds like the, the more appropriate strategy or more practical strategy to go for. Uh, this, this is an interesting question from the audience and I, I found it, I found yeah. it kind of like uh, uh, interesting. It says, uh, so the person is asking, how do you know if the founder or the management team is capable to change and adapt? I feel like it's like, hey, how do you know if you like somebody? <laughs> uh-huh. So, yes. so it's, it's about, is, is that like your, you, you get that from your experience and so it kind of like become like a, a gut feel, a sixth sense, or do you see different, or do you see certain uh, attributes in a founder yeah. that gives you that, that image? Yeah, so um, I should say this, um, the, uh, the, the, there's, uh, you, you can evaluate uh, um, based on two uh, end points. One is before you, be, before you make the investment, um, before you form that, form, that, form that partnership with the founder, and after that, um, after you make the investment. So before you make the investment, you kind of don't know, right? Because um, sometimes you kind of just meet the founder for the first time. And if you have, uh, uh, if you're lucky, you have enough time to do due diligence and then kind of get to know that person. Um, but uh, that, that's why um, it's in, that's why a lot of VCs would like to fund uh, founders that they have worked with in the past, or uh, founders that come through their um, uh, referral network, right? Either through the same school or the same type of founder community, so they can do some at least some high level idea, you know, whether that person uh, achieve things and can, um, you know, face some uh, startup challenges down the road. So that's kind of what best uh, a VC can do before the investment. And that kind of explain why VCs like to invest uh, uh, founders with, with, within certain network. 
and and that kind of again explain the the kind of the diversity issue within VCs. But that's kind of like a whole separate uh, separate topic. Um, yeah. Now, after you make the investment, um, then you kind of uh, you, you know you you form the partnership with the founder. Then typically, you know, on our side, we are very uh, 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 kind of uh, engaged in a way. So we're not like you know texting them all the time, but they will text me all the time. Like you know, this I kind of make myself available because I want to. Um, so you don't. One thing that we do is that we don't impose ourselves as investors. I think that's a really important difference with us compared with many other larger funds. Uh, we see ourselves more like you know the founder's uh, capital partner. Um, the founder's partner to build uh, build a company, so they will text me like you know in the middle of the night or sometime midnight when they have questions about uh, how to prepare their board uh, board meeting materials, or um, you know uh, talk about like what to do if they you know when they lose one big customers, so um, you really have to kind of be at that front seat along with them to see how they face uh, how they react to stress and uh, how they react to re- reject uh, rejection. And to really see and hear the reasoning for a new plan, for the new pivot. And, um, and a lot of times uh, as an investor, your role is not to kind of get into the operational role because if you do that, you might as well just fund yourself and you, you're the unicorn, right? Uh, so it's important for us to recognize our role is not operator, but our role is to really challenge and stress test some of the plan and some of the question, or some of the idea the founders have. Um, and one of the benefits that come with being in venture for a while is that you see a lot of people, you see a lot of problem, and uh, you see a lot of strategy that work and, and the, the one that work and the one that does not work. And then you can kind of uh, uh, do a pattern recognition uh, in a way, uh, at least you can stress test uh, those assumptions and, uh, and see, you know, uh, you know, how the founder respond to that. Um, some founders, they respond really well um, and they can be, you know, data driven. Uh, they can you know, and the, the best the best one that we like is that you kind of combine your market research, your market insight by your conversation with customers and uh, um, and show it us, show us what you say you're going to do. And you kind of test it out for two weeks, four weeks, and you come back with data and say, see, you know, this is what I told you. And uh, here's the only result. And I think there is more that we can do here if we just implement this strategy. And typically it's kind of like more like a partnership type of thing. Um, that's the best kind. Um, the, the danger is that, you know, the v, a VC could be completely hands off and just be completely supportive. And I don't think that's the best partner uh, that you want in building a company. Um, just look at, um, you know, WeWork, right? Look at some other companies, uh, you know, fairly pro- high profile, um, but, uh, um, you know, it, it's just, you know, really unfortunate result uh, that happened uh, with the company building process. Yeah, I feel like uh, if I have to summarize it in one sentence, it's really about the founder reaching out to the investor uh, regularly and as proactively as possible. Uh, even for me as an investor, I would I would always welcome the founder reaching out uh, anytime because it feels like the founder is engaging rather than working in his own home and thinking about ideas. I think communication, active communication and proactiveness really counts. And that demonstrate that the, the, the founder has that agility mindset and also that adaptability mindset as well. Uh, I, I see a lot of questions from the audience and a lot of them evolve around, uh, how do you look at the, how do you review companies? How do you look at tractions at a company? And this kind of like brings, us to the one of the interesting article that you have written on your uh, website. And if you can type your website on the chat box for the audience, oh, yes. so they can mm-hmm. have a chance to go and read them out when they have the time, I think that would be yes. awesome. Uh, yes. So one of the article that you talk about is uh, how do we see conduct due diligence? And you kind of yes. focus on how big is the market. But before we get into that, is I mm-hmm. wanted to uh, to look into some of the questions that the participants have an- has asked is uh, one of them is how much traction uh, do you look for in an early stage startup companies? Because I think that's part of your due diligence as well. What are the traction? And when we talk about early stage, it sounds too broad. And if I can break it down into pre-seed stage, mm. seed stage and series A, 
right? This mm -hmm. is typically the cycle where uh, founders would fundraise. They raise it before seed stage and then they go into seed stage and then they go into series A. I guess if you mm. can break it down into the three phases and what are the traction you would hope to see in those yeah. three phases? Yeah, I think this this good question. It's very uh, practical, you know, if you're a founder and, and thinking about the journey as well. Um, so uh, typically we, uh, you know, kind of think about a startup journey in a few stages, right? So you have a pre-seed um, that's typically, you know, or you can call it angel, angel round or angel stage. Um, and, and what that means is that um, the company doesn't have anything, right? You tend to have a team, at least you know the founder or co-founder, um, and uh, um, you have an idea, um, or at best you have a prototype of, of you know, something to prove that your idea can solve a problem. So uh, at this stage, um, you don't really have, I mean, investors are typically angel investors, all your friends and family, or frankly, you just your, you know, your own money, right, to, to fund the initial effort. Um, and uh, the amount, it doesn't require it to be that big. Typically, you know, uh, 50K, 100K, 100, you know, uh, 200K, something like that, USD. Um, and uh, in this stage, I would advise uh, people to bootstrap as much as you can, because uh, the earlier that, that you take home the outside capital, obviously the more expensive it is, right? Because you need to give up, give out um, more equity to the outside investor. Um, especially if you believe the company, you know, will be a big thing, then you just do the mental calculation, right? So, you know, selling 30% uh, of the company for, um, you know, 20K or 50K, um, you know, might not be that worthwhile um, if you can kind of bootstrap it um, as much as you can. Um, now, the second stage after pre-seed is what we typically call the seed stage. So seed stage, um, from investor side, we typically, uh, we, by we, not, not meaning our fund, but, you know, just uh, seed investor in general, typically write 50, uh, 500K to up to $2 million into a company, uh, depending on, you know, kind of depending on the founder's background and how much you have achieved and accomplished uh, since you have the idea, right? Um, so I would say normally we, we don't see, uh, we, we don't focus, we don't see a lot of traction on the revenue side. Uh, if you're doing enterprise company or doing, uh, even doing consumer company, um, uh, we focus more about the, the idea potential and, and, the, and the founder, um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, again, we talk about like the learning and engagement with the founder, right? So ideally you have Hey, I have this, this. I have this idea. Uh, last year, March, and uh, right now uh, it's been a year. But you know, I only you know I raised like 50k. But look what, how much I have uh, progress that I have made. And not only that, there are more customers in the pipeline want to uh, you know get into get into the door of using my product. But I don't have the bandwidth to support that. So that's a really good signal uh, for us, or at least good uh, kind of uh, things to hear. Um, on the surface. Um, so that, that would be kind of typical seed stage deal. Um, now, after seed, it's what we typically call the venture round, the series A round. Um, uh, then you can think of it more like, a, you know, kind of going to college, right? Um, that's series A round is your college. Uh, if you do well, uh, after you raise seed, uh, ideally you should be able to have some traction um, uh, on the you know on the revenue side, so for enterprise company uh, uh, in in the valley and you know uh, to a certain degree in China uh, as well, um, VCs will look for uh, revenue uh, in the numbers close to one million uh, AR. Um, that's the kind of the for some reason that's a sweet spot, right? People want to think about if you are an enterprise company, get to one million AR, and then you know you you can demand. Uh, uh, to raise roughly five to 10 million series A round based on that traction. Now, if your revenue is slightly lower, that's okay, or higher, that's even better, but that's kind of typical, uh, you know, series A uh, traction, uh, you know, uh, VCs are looking for. Consumer company is a little bit different. Um, consumer is kind of, uh, they, don't, they don't follow a steady pattern because, you know, if you uh, have a huge download, like huge uh, trend that you, you just happen to catch on, then 
sometimes you will have a really easy time to fund fundraise because VC like to kind of uh, you know by nature uh, chase shiny things, especially on the consumer side. Um, there's good or bad, right? There is success stories like Facebook, you know how competitive Series A round was for Facebook, but also there is horror stories. There is a lot of uh, many uh, failed uh, consumer companies, um, even despite raising a lot of capital uh, at Series A round as well. So anyway, so after you raise Series A, then Series B is really the scale. You can think of it like, you know, you finally finished college, now you kind of get into the real world, right? So at Series B, that's a real money. Uh, you kind of, you, you, you typically get it uh, from large VC fund or growth stage fund where you raise roughly about 20 million to $30 million. So that's kind of like uh, at a high level, uh, how we think about the stage of companies. Yeah, when, you know, it's interesting you talk about Series B. There's, in fact, a question from the uh, participants about, you know, uh, Series B and C. And the question is, with the economical turmoil uh, generated by COVID, do you see tighter capital from venture capital funds or tougher condition? Uh, which strategy mm. do you recommend for Series B and C with market conditions like this? Mm. Well, it's a, it, it kind of depends on what you do, right? So um, we obviously have seen many companies um, uh, thrive and enjoy uh, taking the tailwind because of work from home, because of the situation in 2020 um, and in the need for um, kind of digital product and uh, a SaaS product uh, seems to be uh, stronger um, uh, last year. And, you know, we kind of foresee this year as well. So in terms of capital raising, uh, surprisingly, not, uh, has not been slowed uh, at all. Uh, on the other side, it's kind of being accelerated a little bit. Um, you know, uh, except the uh, the Q2 last year, when the U.S. stock market uh, kind of crashed and now bounced back and even kind of you know more up to the right. Um, I think that's kind of reflecting on the VC market as well. All the friends that I know uh, who've been doing venture investment, they keep you know uh, everybody is like they uh, did not expect so many deals are getting done this year. So uh, it's very counterintuitive. Um, so I, I can't explain that, um, but uh, you know, I think the general trend is that people uh, on the LP side, people want to invest in technology because um, uh, the kind of the long view, 10 years, you see the world will becoming more automated and more, uh, more empowered by, uh, by technology uh, than the traditional side. Um, but some, some categories are tougher, so without any doubt. Um, so it's not like all the players will benefit, um, but that has been the case uh, you know, with or without COVID anyway. The winners tend to kind of take most of the resources as well as capital. Um, so that then really has changed uh, you know, either before uh, 2020 or after 2020. Got it. You were breaking up a little bit, I think, in your last two sentences, if you can repeat that. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, so I was just saying, um, uh, you know, the dynamic of uh, good companies um, takes most of the capital, most of the resource. That hasn't changed, you know, before 2020 or after 2020, right? That always been the dynamic. You know, the, the company that in the top quartile, they tend to kind of withdraw, um, tend to attract most of the resources anyway. Yeah. I see there are still a lot more questions coming in. I will try to address as many as possible. Uh, yeah. And the next question that we have is, uh, I think we already talked a little bit about that, but uh, it asks, what do investors look for in, uh, uh, apart from investment return? Which I thought, mm. I, think, I think we do look for investment return. That's kind of like the ultimate goal, but I'll let you, uh, I'll let you answer that. And, and uh, how do we see build trust? Uh, mm. and understanding of the high-risk environment. Like, I, I, it, I feel like to some extent, this is part of our gene, right? We, we know that making uh, investment to startup is high risk and therefore we expect high return. And, and that's kind of correlated to investment return in a way. Yeah. What's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, yeah, abso absolutely. And then frankly, that's the beauty of investing in early stage companies, right? Um, uh, Frankly, I love it. You know, I think this is the best job in the world. Um, you know, you kind of uh, know the founder from day one. I mean, it's easy to um, kind of uh, uh, kind of invest later stage in a way when everything becomes clear and, you know, founder has beautiful office and uh, everything is set in place. But for me, I, I really love uh, investing early. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, outside of financial return, 
personally for me is that uh, is that feeling of you know kind of bonding uh, with founder when nobody else believes in them but you do um, and you see them become successful um, you know like VC tend to say you know you invest in companies kind of like you have a bunch of kids right and you know, in a strange way it's, it's kind of like that you know you want them to be successful and when they do you're super just kind of proud of what they have achieved um, because you are always the one that's it's kind of like sitting on, uh, behind the scene uh, on the back seat rather than uh, front and center. So, so I would say that's the, uh, that, that's a, that's the thing. Uh, I think early stage investing is super exciting, um, but uh, without question, like financial return is always number one. Like you can have fun, you can kind of enjoy all the interaction you want, but at the end of the day, if you cannot generate return, then it doesn't really matter, you know, how much you love the job, right? You have to deliver return. Um, there's one thing that uh, one of my uh, mentors, he used to say, you know, when he like on the fundraising trail with the LPs, you know, he said that I would rather lose, uh, I would rather lose the LP than to lose the LP's money. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of summarize everything, right? And frankly, that's kind of the business that we're in. So. Yeah, that, I think that you answered that very beautifully. Yeah. Uh, and then the next question we have, uh, it's more um, it's more about China because you do have experience uh, in investing into China. It talks about do government and private forces in China prevent the big through of new young unicorns in China? Personally, I don't think so. If you look at the statistic, China is already ranked second in terms of the number of um, uh, unicorns in the world. I, I think uh, they. I think they. They have about thirty-seven percent as a total global unicorn. So I don't think that any of these forces have ever prevented uh, unicorn from coming out from China. But I guess the question is about breakthrough. So what's your view on that? Uh, breakthrough in in terms of what? In terms of uh, like uh, any government or private forces, do you think mm. any of those shape? China's unicorn or prevented mm. any unicorn from any company from becoming a unicorn? Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of echo your point, right? So the historic data shows that that hasn't happened. And just, you know, I don't think there is a reason to believe that that will be a force to prevent more unicorn from being created in the future. Um, and <clears throat> if anything, you know, I actually think um, with all um, antitrust, uh, you know, movement that's going on uh, in both countries, in US, US and China, I actually think long-term that's a good thing uh, for startups to, uh, to, 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 to grab a foothold so that they can be a unicorn company. So I think- uh, A lot of younger companies. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, you broke out. Yeah. You broke out as well uh, just now. Maybe just repeat okay. the last sentence. Yeah. So, so I was saying that the antitrust is actually um, a good thing in terms of a uh, long term for providing breathing room for a uh, more younger startup um, to thrive. So, yeah. uh, if anything, I actually more bullish about more unicorn being created in both countries. Yeah, the next question, it's also kind of focused on China. It says, mm. to what point does the huge internal consumption in China negate the need of a SaaS platform to expand go globally? Is being China-centric a, a viable strategic decision if you are still looking for international VC? Personally, though, based on my own experience, if you can, if any startup can uh, address the China market, you'd be big enough to be a, <laughs> more than a unicorn. So there isn't a need for a startup to really go into China or go global or go to the US. I think the point is about being focused on one particular market. And, mm -hmm. and what have you been seeing? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, you know, I think China has, um, uh, well, either China or any other ecosystem, right? You, you play with your strengths. You can't play by other people's role. So uh, what China was good at um, was, in, was in hardware, was in manufacturing and um, was in exporting, right? So those parts, it makes sense to build a company like DJI um, and the, you, where you have your you know, majority of your customer base is in the Western world, in the US. Um, however, you know, if you kind of think about SaaS or enterprise, 
you know, I agree with you. Um, I think China being, uh, you know, uh, soon to be the largest market in the world uh, has that uh, internal um, uh, market, market size and market demand to create not just unicorn company. Uh, unicorn company is only 1 billion evaluation. I mean, I think I'm thinking about like 10 billion, even 1 trillion companies. So what the question that we we want to do, I mean, you know, we talk about like being ambitious and being, you know, backing the ambitious uh, is really like, how can we being a uh, uh, early stage investor backing to back the next iconic companies? Uh, think about the Microsoft of China, right? The Intel of China um, and, uh, um, you know, Salesforce of China. And that's our AI first and AI driven in this AI age. Um, and that's what gets us excited. Uh, and I think China, you know, when we go through the fundamental uh, analysis, China does have that um, fundamental uh, in terms of market size and, and customer base to support that. Not now, not next year, but, you know, uh, being early stage investor is, uh, is about long term. So we're looking at five, uh, five to 10 years and even longer. Yeah, uh, we are uh, actually uh, right on time at the end of the session, but I'm going to ask two more questions and then uh, we'll, we'll have to close the session uh, for our next for next time. Uh, one of one question is quite interesting because I think that's what a lot of startups tend to be struggling with. The question is many SaaS founders have a hard time choosing the target segment in the early stage. Should I target mm. the large enterprise or the SME? Meaning, should I be the hybrid or Shopify of this field? So from your experience, Jay, what questions should they ask to decide the fo to focus? And, mm. uh, and is it realistic to build solutions covering both segments as a startup or should they be more focused? I think, yeah, I think every startup, every startup yeah. goes through that struggle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a really practical one, practical one as well. Uh, uh, the short answer, obviously, it, it depends on the product that you're offering. Uh, but, you know, one thing that I uh, that we see is fairly universal in B2B companies is that uh, at the end of the day, you, you want to secure the large account. You want to secure the large logo and contract. Um, but from where you are here to there, how do you get there? That's typically the struggle. So uh, for an example of Workboard, um, it, you know, they tip, uh, initially they tried the Slack approach, which is the bottom up approach, right? You kind of talk to the employee, the team member, the, man, the mid layer manager, and then once you have the momentum, you kind of go to the top level and do the enterprise sell. So that, that way, the, good, the, the advantage is that you kind of shorten the sell cycle, hopefully a little bit. Um, and you kind of build more data point and credibility as you go uh, before you kind of approach to the, the CTO and CIO level uh, of decision maker. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that works. But uh, in, in just in workforce, workforce case, uh, they kind of did detour a little bit. It ended up, you know, the CIO, CXO, uh, they tend to love it because it gives them much better visibility of what's going on with the company at the, at the, you know, at the holistic view. So actually top down approach works a lot better than the bottom up. Um, so they ended up kind of just, you know, kind of, you know, with 80% focus on the, the top down sale and then 20 kind of bottom up versus before is 80, 20. Um, so I think, you know, always kind of experiment what works and what, what does not. Um, typically, it's not a one way, uh, like a either or answer. Typically, you have a hybrid approach. I think the 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 the, um, uh, the, the, the question is really like what percentage that you want to dedicate your, uh, uh, your resource in the go to market strategy uh, really rely on. So um, so that's a part um, that that as a CEO you probably want to think a lot more about, a lot more about. And again, you know, um, at early stage, at seed and Series A. Oftentimes, you are not only the CEO, you're also the VP of sales as well, right? So you will spend a lot of time in front of the customers. Um, so ideally, if you pay attention, uh, you should be able to derive really good customers insight and marketing insight from there. And that kind of give you the first hand information uh, to guide you what type of approach will be the best um, um, you know, and most suitable. And you know, kind of looping back to the, the <clears throat> looping back to uh, the conversation that we had earlier is that, you know, if you have a, v, a VC partner that you can trust, that you can kind of just, um, you know, uh, run idea with, 
and act who act as a sounding board that tend to be super helpful uh, when you kind of go through this type of uh, uh, mental exercise. Yeah, and I think the final question, it's also something that uh, it's, 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 uh, I found it uh, insightful to actually uh, learn about it. It's, um, this question is, uh, have you heard startups um, went from the US to China or other Asian countries and became very successful later on? Uh, and he's, he or she is hoping to find out what are some common characteristics of a US startups they uh, need to have before considering expanding into Asian market. And I think to some extent, it's n whichever country that you're expanding beyond your local base, they're mm. bound to be something that you should already have a foundation. So I guess the question is really about what foundation should you have before you decide to explore a new market beyond your own country? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so US and China is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, tricky in that both are big, right? Both are huge market in by itself by themselves. So if you are a US based company, you're pretty much um, kind of satisfied or kind of happy with the customer space in the US. And you're likely to be a public company if you execute well already, right? Um, so that's why many US companies, uh, so on the enterprise side, don't think about going outside the US for a long time, right? Maybe you become a public company then maybe you kind of start thinking about, you know, China strategy or whatnot. Uh, same with China. Um, China, I think so far, not so much on the enterprise side yet. Uh, most of the consumer companies, you know, the, because the consumer uh, B2C market is so robust and so big in China. Um, but, you know, the, the, um, the, the huge, uh, huge unicorn company that's, um, uh, uh, that's in China, they are kind of happy. Um, if they are deciding to go out of China, probably think about Southeast Asia, uh, think about India um, as well. Um, there is one exception. I mean, for example, with High Review, which they do uh, the, the video inter interviewing platform, um, they did think about China, uh, you know, at a fairly early stage, Series B and Series C. And, and, and that's only because uh, I was uh, serving on the board. Uh, and I was like, what about China? What about China? Right. Think about China. Right. So if you want to scale your revenue, uh, you have a U.S. sales force already. And, um, you know, I have connection and I have insight to China. That's at least talk about it. Um, so another interesting thing is that uh, a lot of times company, they don't run the system systematic uh, process uh, that much. Uh, it's really about who is involved. Right. So if you have more cross border investors happen to be on board. Then that conversation probably come up sooner than later. Um, uh, so it's kind of, uh, I think disappointingly, it's kind of more ad hoc, uh, than a very systematic, uh, way to think about it, uh, for company yeah. side. So Jay, I want to say thank you very much for sharing all these very insightful information. What, there are some questions in the, in the participants, uh, uh, asking how to connect with you. What was mm. your preferred way of connecting with the, with the, uh, the audiences? Is it through your website or is it through LinkedIn? Yeah, so, so first of all, um, I really enjoyed the chat. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, definitely uh, look forward to connecting uh, with the rest of the uh, community uh, members uh, as well. Uh, can you still hear? Yes. Can you still hear me? Yes, I, okay, can, fantastic. I can. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, so one way that uh, we can do is um, definitely go to uh, my website and my uh, uh, sub Substack newsletter. Um, I typically kind of publish um, our thoughts at Leonis Capital um, from that newsletter. Uh, if you sign up, uh, you will get the um, content delivered to the mailbox um, directly. Uh, mostly, you know, on a biweekly basis, we we'll try to be kind of consistent that way. Um, and the other way is that, you know, I'm uh, also on Twitter. Uh, so my handle is uh, uh, Jay Zhao S. Uh, that's my handle at Twitter. And, Can you um, type it into uh, the chat box? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. I, let me just make sure I did that. So that's my Twitter. And, um, uh, you know, if folks use WeChat, uh, I'm happy to share my WeChat as well. Um, so this is my Jay Zhao WeChat. It's very simple, uh, nothing innovative there, uh, but that's my handle on WeChat. Um, so that those are probably the best way to, to reach me um, if people want to have a quick chat. Uh, obviously there's a LinkedIn, just search my name. 
uh, with Leonis Capital. So multiple ways. Yeah. And uh, I want to end the session with a light note on something fun, uh, I guess, <laughs> but uh, also uh, can create deep thoughts. Uh, you, Jay, you had analyzed uh, an article by the New York Times, and it talks about learning resilience from a 1,000-year-old mochi shop. So this mochi shop is in Kyoto in Japan. Uh, if we can travel again, I would definitely want to visit the, the shop. Uh, so they have gone through ups and downs, you know, through <laughs> through the past 1,000 years. And for people who are interested, uh, you can visit Jay's uh, website uh, and read up on that article. I think it's very interesting. And if we can travel, we can definitely, you know, try the mochi. So on that, yeah, I, I wanted to I thank again. I definitely will try the mochi. <laughs> I wanted to thank again, Jay, for uh, uh, coming to this call. And uh, and I do apologize if we are not able to go through all the questions that you have. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Jay directly. Uh, and thank you for all your participation. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye, guys. Mm -hmm.